A new chapter along the Nile, Egypt and Ethiopia agreed to reset relations after decades of tensions over the river. But with upstream countries in desperate need of energy, how long can these new deals last? And who is set to benefit the most? And with 160 million people living along its banks, is there enough water for everyone? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the programme. I'm Darren Jordan. Egypt and Ethiopia are looking to put past disputes over the use of Nile water behind them after Ethiopia's Prime Minister visited Cairo for the first time since a popular uprising toppled the Mubarak regime back in February. Zanawi and his Egyptian counterpart Issam Sharaf agreed to set up a team of experts to review Ethiopia's controversial dam project. Well, Egypt and Ethiopia have agreed to review the impact of a Nile River dam project planned for Ethiopia. A colonial-era treaty allotted the bulk of the river's water to Egypt and Sudan, but other Nile River countries want to change that. Well, the Nile is the world's longest river, running almost 7,000 kilometres through 11 African countries. In 1929, Egypt and the UK signed a treaty giving Egypt 48 billion cubic metres of water annually, with veto power over upstream projects. And Sudan was given 4 billion cubic metres. Following Sudan's independence in 1956, Egypt and Sudan renegotiated the agreement in 1959 based on an annual flow of 84 billion cubic metres. The 1959 agreement allocated 55.5 billion cubic metres, or three quarters of the water to Egypt, and 18.5 billion cubic metres, or one quarter, to Sudan. But last year, six of the nine Nile nations called for limits on Egypt's share, and now Ethiopia wants to build a $4.8 billion dam to generate electricity. Well, apart from the Nile River Dam, Ethiopia has announced plans to construct two more dams along its share of the Nile as part of a plan to produce 20,000 megawatts of power within the next 10 years. Well, the Egyptian Prime Minister highlighted the positive nature of the talk, saying they're part of a comprehensive development strategy. Today we're talking about complete development plans between the two countries. If there is a specific issue between the countries, we will solve it. The issue of the Nile Dam, this particular dam, along with others planned, could be a source of benefit and a corridor of development between Egypt, Ethiopia and Sudan. We have agreed to quickly establish the tripartite team of technical experts to review the impact of the dam that is being built in Ethiopia, and we have agreed to continue to work uh, on the basis of a win-win solution for all countries in the Nile Basin. Well, joining us now are our guests in Cairo, Dr. Diar Eldin El Kusi, a water expert formerly with the National Water Research Center. In London, Adel Darwish, the author of Water Wars, Coming Conflicts in the Middle East, also a commentator on the Middle East region. Uh, Adel Darwish in London, let me start with you, if I may. I mean, what's your assessment of Egypt and Ethiopia's resetting of relations? I mean, and how is it likely to impact on this long running issue uh, of dividing up the Nile water? Well, first of all, I think the uh, Prime Minister of, uh, uh, of, of, of Ethiopia, Zinabwe, was actually there because he wanted to make use of the uh, fund before the deadline of contribution to the fund runs out. You know, the fund is $150 uh, million. Uh, it's about uh, $6 million short. The African uh, countries put $14 million, and then $130 million came from American, the European Union, and other donors. So I think it's a tactical move. Secondly, uh, I think the Egyptians made a terrible mistake under the uh, uh, late dictator Colonel Nasser when they, when they set a precedent of signing a 1959 agreement rather than sticking to the 1929 agreement uh, of actually the use of water Nile. And thirdly, uh, they should have made it actually very clear to the Ethiopians that customary use is an enshrined principle in international law. And the Egyptians have been using uh, 87 percent of the Nile uh, water, uh, while the other Iberian states altogether they really don't need more than 5 percent. So they should have really made it very clear to the Ethiopians where the Egyptians stand. All right. Well, let's get the viewpoint from Cairo then. Uh, Dia El Kusi, uh, how significant is this resetting of relations between Egypt and Ethiopia? I mean, relations between both countries uh, have been very much strained over the issue of who gets what from the Nile. Is this deal likely to work, do you think? 
Well, this is not actually very common uh, because the relationship between Egypt and uh, Ethiopia throughout history was uh, quite friendly. Huh? There was no problems whatsoever. Uh, all, uh, everything started uh, sort of, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, emerging uh, after the uh, Nile Basin Initiative was uh, started in, uh, in 1999. And uh, even with the uh, Nile Basin Initiative, uh, they spent more than 10 years without actual uh, uh, apparent uh, problems. But during the last two years, uh, and after exactly after the uh, meeting in Kinshasa in May 2009, and this was followed by uh, a meeting in Alexandria, and then the last meeting was in Sharm el Sheikh, when uh, when a lot of problems appeared, and uh, and the major differences between uh, Egypt and Sudan on one side, and uh, Ethiopia and the upstream countries on the other, was threefold <laughs> actually. Number one. Uh, was the uh, water security issue and uh, uh, Egypt and Sudan look looks at uh, water security as uh, the uh, confirmation and uh, and uh, and holding of the uh, of the uh, old agreements like the tw uh, 1929 and 1959 agreements Number two was uh, the issue of uh, majority and uh, over and uh, consensus. And uh, in this, Egypt and Sudan say that we are a minority actually in the, in the Nile Basin because there are only two uh, downstream countries against uh, eight or nine upstream countries. Okay, well, let's, um, let's third, put the. Uh, okay, listen, let me just quickly put this issue of consensus to Adel Darwish because um, Adel Darwish, no matter what the politicians hammer out on the table in terms of any kind of water agreement, uh, the big question, of course, is is there enough water to actually go around? I mean, 160 million people live along the banks of the Nile. Um, Energy-hungry countries like Ethiopia uh, need to tap its reserves. They need huge quantities of water uh, to feed these massive irrigation projects. Is there enough for everybody? Well, the, 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 the issue here is um, what do you, how do you define water? I mean, the crops themselves import and export are water. The water evaporated, the, um, if you can actually have hydraulic energy coming out of it and all of that. So you need some kind of a project, uh, not sort of rhetoric, but practically. Uh, if the uh, upper riparian nations actually uh, still can have water coming from the rain, great deal of it. Uh, secondly, projects like uh, the dredging of the White Nile, which actually comes in South Sudan, where you have uh, something like uh, 20 billion or 28 billion uh, cubic meters actually evaporated uh, in the heat, so dredging it would uh, speed up uh, the water flow, so you actually have more water coming in. Thirdly, the Ethiopians do not actually need that much more for agriculture if they actually have it as a hydraulic energy. And then you have a project like building railway lines and exporting this hydraulic energy to Europe and to North Africa and the rest of Africa. Then they can have enough actually money uh, to buy uh, crops and get interest out of the water. So it doesn't have to be agriculture. Because agriculture is wastage of water. And so customary, when the Egyptians have been planting the same uh, sort of um, amount of, of, of land for the last 7,000 years, then you can't just come there and say, yes, you can have a majority or consensus and take this right away from them. That's an enshrined international law. And third and most importantly, uh, President Sadat understood uh, the, uh, the, the balances of power there, and he never actually removed the military option from the table negotiation. Foolishly, uh, the regime of President Mubarak have been actually been looking into sort of some kind of outside Egypt interest, uh, conflict with Israel, all this nonsense, rather than making it very clear that the Egyptian interest, number one, is the Nile and all options on the table, including the military option, if someone touches the Nile. Uh, we'll come back to the military option uh, in just a second. Um, Dia El Kusi, was there ever a way of solving this critical water issue under 
the Husni Mubarak era? Or did it take regime change uh, to get this deal on the table between the Egyptians and the Ethiopians? Well, I, I feel that it is a technical issue, actually. It, 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 it's not really connected to what regime are you talking about. Now, we have three sub-basins in the Nile. Uh, one of them in the, in the equatorial lakes and one in the Ethiopian highlands and the third is in uh, South Sudan in Bahr al-Ghazal. And the uh, rainfall on each and every one of these sub-basins is almost identical. You have 500 billion here, 500 billion here and 500 billion there more or less. And, uh, and uh, uh, the contribution of the Ethiopian highlands to the main Nile natural flow is 85%, and the contribution of the equatorial lakes is 15%. The area of Bahr al-Ghazal, the contribution is almost zero, and that's where the Nile leaves its uh, course and uh, uh, water spreads over huge areas of swamps and lakes. And there you can have a lot of water if you can capture these losses. And this was the, the whole uh, discussion on the Nile Basin Initiative, how to make use of all this water which is wasted in some places and some locations of the Nile. So the solution of the problem is technical more than political. Well, let me put that question uh, to Adel Darwish. I mean, there is a huge amount of political emotions that's associated with the Nile, <clears> despite uh, what D.L. Kusi says, that it's technical rather than political. Many people say uh, that Husni Mubarak <clears> turned <throat> his back uh, on Africa after the assassination attempt uh, on his life in Addis Ababa in 1995, and that led to a worsening of relations uh, with Africa. What's your take on that? Yes, that's, that's precisely correct. But that's just part of the story. The turning back on Africa started under the former dictator Colonel Nasser because his obsession with his project to control the Arab world through going to war in Yemen and starting wars with Israel and all of that. And President Sadat, when he understood that, he focused again on the Nile. Now, the combination of the assassination attempt uh, on, on, on President Mubarak's life the uh, Isla Islamist uh, regime in Sudan, as well as uh, his sort of diverting attention from his problem and his lack of democracy and dictatorship by highlighting the tension with Israel has actually taken the focus away from the Nile. So I totally agree uh, that the whole focus on Africa should have remained there and the whole uh, project of the Nile basin should have been uh, uh, the same way that Winston Churchill have actually seen it in his book, The River War, when he said the whole Nile Basin should be a geopolitical unit where Egypt actually is the crown of the tree and all the riparian nations are uh, the, 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 the roots uh, of this tree. And therefore, again, a project that would have seen the dredging of the Bahr al-Ghazal area so you, you, you capture almost as much as it comes from Ethiopia would actually be flowing there uh, uh, north. But then again, time was wasted in the war, which initiated by the Islamist regime uh, in Khartoum against the south. So that project actually stopped. So if you, you have to go back into seeing the whole Nile Basin as one geopolitical unit. And I'm afraid you have to go back to the 1929 agreement because that agreement it's not just putting in favor of Egypt. It actually was putting a whole mega, mega project there for the next 100 years. Unfortunately, that been taken away uh, from the table. Yes, and, and the reality today, uh, D.L. Kusi uh, in Cairo, is that much of this agreement uh, on a Nile deal uh, has been pushed by the upstream countries. I mean, how have they managed, do you think, to narrow the gap uh, between the upstream and downstream countries that include, obviously, Egypt? Well, this is a difficulty now, because uh, because uh, m uh, people like uh, Prime Minister uh, Zinawi is saying that these are old uh, agreements that has to be changed, and uh, Egypt and Sudan has to come and uh, sign with us on the uh, framework agreement, and the framework agreement is not agreeable at all to the Egyptians and the Sudanese. And here you have to work hard on the negotiation table. But the, the, the major argument in this uh, respect is uh, that uh, Egypt has always 
being uh, a sort of uh, I don't want to say like a donor country to 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 other riparian countries. Egypt has advanced a little bit, uh, probably faster than uh, other uh, Nile Basin countries, and Egypt has to return back some of this favor to these countries. And uh, as you've seen yesterday in the, uh, in the signature of a number of agreements here in Cairo between the Prime Minister, the Egyptian Prime Minister, and the Ethiopian Prime Minister, all, almost all six uh, agreements uh, were actually in favor of Ethiopia. You, you, you're talking about uh, technical assistance in agriculture, you're talking about uh, uh, f uh, fisheries, you're talking about uh, uh, livestock, you, you're talking about uh, training of uh, engineers and technicians, etc. You're talking even about t tax refund here and there. Uh, but, but President or Prime Minister uh, Zinawi he did not even say one word about, uh, about stopping the uh, framework agreement uh, for a while, or he did not talk about, uh, about stopping the construction of dams on the Nile for a while. Okay. So Egypt has been always like giving and not waiting to take, actually. Um, Adel Darwish, let's talk about some of those uh, dams, some of the projects, uh, particularly upstream. I mean, apart from the Grand Renaissance Dam, um, Ethiopia, we know, has announced plans to build uh, two more dams along its share uh, of the Nile over the next 10 years. Are countries like Egypt downstream going to sit back and watch that happen? Well, it would be actually irresponsible to do that. In fact, I'm even surprised that the Egyptian prime minister, actually, by the way, non-elected prime minister, so he has no right to sign away uh, this kind of agreement. You know, he sort of came on the back of a military coup after the revolution. So all these agreements should have been postponed. Zinawi's motivation is to sign this agreement before the end of the year so he can actually make use of the funds there, the 144 million pounds in the fund there, uh, sorry, dollars in the fund there. So the Egyptians should have spotted that. So, thirdly, the Egyptians actually last year when the other riparian nations signed the agreement with the Eastern Sudan, they should have created dispute. They should have gone to international court and say, this agreement violates basic principle of international law, which is interfering with the customary use. In 1989, when the Ethiopians were trying to build two, three dams um, on the uh, uh, Blue Nile, they just made it clear. They said, if the work doesn't stop, the Egyptian Air Force is going to bomb them. That was in 1989. And in fact, the Israeli engineers working there were withdrawn straight away because the Israelis asked a question in the Knesset, saying, what are you doing? You want us to ruin uh, the relationship with Egypt? No, no, the Egyptians have the right to use the night. So the Egyptians actually have been sitting on their head. I'm, I'm, I'm just totally surprised, actually, that they let their national interest be harmed that way. There should have been international court last year to actually create illegal disputes and don't move any option from the table, including the military option, to say, do not touch the Nile, let do me, not touch the floor. Let me, yes. let me quickly ask um, D.L. Kusi in Cairo um, about Israel. We haven't spoken much about Israel, although you've just mentioned um, Israel there, Adel Darwish. Um, D.L. Kusi, I mean, do you think Israel perhaps uh, has benefited from this political vacuum in Africa left under the Mubarak regime? I mean, Israel plans now to set up shop uh, in South Sudan. They're looking to take water from the source of the Nile straight to Israel without going through Egypt uh, and the Sinai Peninsula. I mean, what's Israel doing, do you think? Well, I, uh, I, I believe that uh, Israel can never miss this type of opportunities. Now you have uh, South Sudan, with, uh, b there is a, a bit of vacuum in, in South Sudan, and uh, with this uh, type of, of, uh, of uh, misunderstanding even between uh, Egypt and Ethiopia, unless you uh, very quickly uh, bridge this uh, gap, uh, and not only between Egypt and Ethiopia, but uh, even between Egypt and, and all uh, Nile uh, Basin riparian countries. So uh, b b the, the Israel will, will never uh, sort of, uh, of stand uh, uh, like quiet uh, when seeing uh, any trouble that can be made, and uh, uh, they did not do it. Uh, th this is very clear for everybody. 
Um, Adel Darwish, how do you see Israel uh, maintaining uh, or growing water security along the Nile? Right, okay, this is two issues. Issue number one, because Israel is very existent, actually threatened by the Arabs and Arab nationalism. I don't really blame them for trying to find uh, a way of surviving. Number two, going back to President Sadat in the 1970s when he was actually trying to cement peace with Israel, he offered, he offered to sell uh, water by, out of uh, a, a, a water carrier via Sinai to Israel. And he was, it was a cunning plan. He actually wanted to take Israel on his side as a downstream country, benefiting from Egyptian water projects. Therefore, when upper uh, uh, Nile, uh, uh, upper riparian nations try to mess about with the flow of the water, then he will have an ally in Israel that actually would stand with him. And that was he, because, because President Sadat was looking on the long term of Egyptian interest. He actually comes back from a nationalist background uh, in the 1930s and 40s as an Egyptian nationalist, unlike Colonel Nasser, unlike uh, Mubarak. And because of Israel being put in a situation now where its existence is actually threatened, of course, you know, they have to do that. So going back to actually making a deal with Israel, saying, no, we have to offer you the water, as President Sadat said, and that would be for the benefit of Egypt on the long term. Uh, dear El Kusi, let's uh, quickly discuss that military option. I mean, is there ever likely to be war uh, over the Nile waters? Are we likely to see military confrontation in the Middle East because there just isn't enough water to go around? Um, no, no, I don't believe that uh, there will be an, uh, any fight on water in this uh, area. And uh, I feel that the, uh, the, the only and uh, the, uh, the, 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 and, uh, and the, 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 the only solution to all this is uh, discussions, negotiations uh, through uh, uh, a sort of win-win uh, uh, approach. Uh, if everybody, if if everybody on the table uh, is uh, satisfied with the with the deal he made on the uh, on the water of the Nile, not only the water, the water, the electricity, agriculture, etc., uh, etc., et If everybody feels satisfied and happy, then things can be solved. If anybody feels that he is uh, has not taken his his right share of uh, the cake, then we will continue this type of struggle for years and years. Um, Adel Darwish, interestingly, uh, you wrote a book entitled Water Wars. Um, are we likely to see countries do battle over the Nile? I mean, is a lack of agreement likely to result in military action? Well, it's extremely irresponsible of any negotiator um, looking after his or her national interest uh, to actually exclude an option. So I'm surprised that my Egyptian colleague there excluding the military option uh, when he actually is in Egypt in Cairo. He should say all options are there on the table, including the military. That's number one. Number two, 3,000 years ago, Queen Hatshepsut actually did send 84 uh, 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 ships of the Egyptian fleet to occupy what's now Ethiopia and Somalia and subjected them to protect the source of, uh, of the Nile and then had a trade agreement to then the, and, and the grow agriculture they were actually bought by the Egyptians. Thirdly, we have seen 1987 war between Senegal um, and, 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 and Mauritania over uh, the river Senegal. And Errol Sharon himself told me when I was researching the book that the Six Day War in 1967 uh, 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 started because of water, because Colonel Nasser wanted to divert water away from Israel. And the Syrians uh, brought earth-moving equipment to divert the Yarmouk away from the uh, Sea of Galilee or Lake Tepris, uh, the Arabs call it, which is the headwater of the Jordan. And that's why this skirmishes and exchange of fire from April 1967 onwards that actually led to the Six-Day War. So we actually do have a precedent there that that, that water dispute okay. led to a war. OK, uh, it, is, it is a fascinating topic, gentlemen. I'm afraid we have to leave it there. Thanks to our guests in Cairo, D.R. Eldin El Kusi, and in London, Adel Darwish. And thank you so much for joining us here on this edition of Inside Story. We, of course, welcome your comments and your suggestions. Please email them to us at insidestory at aljazeera.net. From the whole team here, goodbye for now.